Yeah, like I mentioned in the previous video, I wanted to share some techniques with you for improving the generalization performance of a model. So I did a very spontaneous uh, yeah, brainstorming session where I took a mind map software and just wrote down everything I, oh, I, that came to mind. This list might not be very exhaustive. There might be other techniques I'm not list, uh, listing here. Here I was really just focusing on the most popular ones that came to mind that are useful in practice. And yeah, of course, we can't cover all of them in detail in this course because yeah, there are so many other topics to talk about. But at least you get the big picture and you may want to look into some of these techniques that you could find useful for your class project. So like I said, this was pretty spontaneous. So there might be different ways to organize this better, but I chose a few categories to have some structure to this. So one category is, I call it data set. So here I'm referring to techniques that really modify um, either the features or the labels in the data set or even yeah, creating new data sets or using different data sets. So I would say personally one of the best bangs for the buck uh, if you want to improve model performance is collecting more data if you can. This is not always the case of course but there are many scenarios where more data can generally be helpful. And this will also be something I will discuss a little bit more in detail in the next um, lecture. Uh, sorry not next lecture in the next video. I will show you a graphic or a plot that can help you um, yeah, finding out whether more data could be useful. Another technique is data augmentation. So this is for modifying the input features. So by, for instance, rotating an image and things like that. And that is also something I will talk more about in the next video. So yeah, another technique is label smoothing. Personally, I haven't really worked with that um, extensively. I only have used that in the context of uh, generative adversarial networks, but I think it can be also useful in a general con uh, classification context. It's basically preventing the classifier to become too confident and that can be achieved by, um, yeah, instead of using, let's say, zero, one labels by having softer versions of that, for instead, instead of, um, let's say, zero and one, we can use point one and point nine. And this has been shown to be helpful in the context of generative generative adversarial networks and I can think of also classification of being uh, positively affected by that in certain cases. Um, then a big topic is yeah, leveraging unlabeled data. We talked about this a little bit in the introduction to this course. Um, so one approach is semi-supervised learning, which is essentially about uh, leveraging unlabeled data by looking at how confident your classifier is. So you fit your classifier on the subset of labeled data and then you apply it to unlabeled data. For example, if you have a larger data set where you have data points that are not labeled yet. And if the classifier is very confident for some of those, then you may um, yeah, consider them or you can consider the predicted labels as the true labels to make your training set larger. Self-supervised learning is a little bit different. So self-supervised learning is also leveraging unlabeled data, but here you create a so-called pretext task where you make up a different classification task for which you can create the data yourself. So I showed you in the introduction to this course like an example of yeah, solving a jigsaw puzzle where you take an image and then you divide that image into smaller sub-images and then you train a network to predict the order of these images. That would be, for example, self-supervised learning. But yeah, these are topics, um, both semi-supervised and self-supervised learning, that go a little bit beyond the scope of this course. That might be a future topic uh, for a different course at some point for more like advanced topics. Um, yeah, so also related to what I just said, there is also a set of techniques for leveraging related data. So self-supervised learning is really like a leveraging unlabeled data. Um, it could be from the same domain or the same data set that you're working with for which you have labels. So let's say you have a data set for which you have labels, but you can design this pretext task on the same data set. So here you may also consider a related different data set. So for instance, uh, one technique is called meta learning, where you essentially learn how to learn like from different data sets, and let's say multiple small data sets. This is actually very common in the context of few shot learning. 
Um, and another, this is a little bit unfortunate, another definition of meta learning is also really uh, learning from metadata. That is another thing. So you have multiple data sets. You can create metadata and then train a classifier on that metadata. Um, and yeah, another technique is transfer learning. So uh, actually this came up when I was just grading class projects. So some students are working on um, COVID-19 prediction from chest X-ray data. So, but the data sets are very small. So one thing one could do is to collect a different data set of lung X-ray images, for instance, for diagnosing a different disease. And then you train a classifier on this large data set for, let's say, um, I don't know, some other lung disease. And then after you train the model, you take that model and fine tune it to the COVID-19 chest X-ray database. So we will talk about transfer learning also briefly later in this course. So it's actually a very useful technique too. So okay, so this was uh, all considering data sets. And so there's also, there are some techniques uh, related to architecture setup, how you yeah, structure your architecture, the deep uh, neural network architecture. So there will be weight initialization strategies. We will discuss that in this course. So I don't want to talk too much about it at this point. Yeah, choosing activation functions. We talked about this already um, yeah, last week when we talked about, for example, the ReLU activation function. Uh, residual layers, they are so-called, um, I consider them as yeah, skip connections. I think they are sometimes called skip connections. So we are skipping or we are adding a connection by skipping certain layers that can also be helpful to avoid vanishing and exploding gradient problems. And this is also something we will talk later about in this course. So there's also yeah knowledge distillation. So this is uh, beyond the scope of, uh, scope of this course, but it's a kind of an interesting setup where you train a large neural network and then you call it the teacher. And then you have a smaller neural network, you call it the student network. And the student network learns to predict based on the predictions from the teacher. So you train the teacher on this data set and then you run this teacher to make or create the predictions and you train the student, usually a smaller network, on the predictions of the teacher. And what's kind of interesting about that is, yeah, for the teacher, you can run it infinitely on also yeah, larger data sets. So you can actually have um, yeah, infinite, in a way, infinite predictions for the student. Anyways, um, yeah, another set of techniques concerns normalization. We talked already about input standardization. I will mention it again in the next video when I show you the data augmentation. Uh, there is also a set of techniques related to batch normalization. This is related to input standardization, but here um, it's internal in the network. So instead of only looking at the inputs to the network, we also look at all the inputs to the hidden layers. So the hidden layer activations, and we normalize those too. There are also um, we have flavors of that called group norm and instance norm and layer norm. And also those are a topic for a future lecture in this course. Yeah, weight standardization, there's also, there are also techniques for standardizing weights. It's kind of related to the weight initialization um, topic, but there are also yeah, additional topics for that. And also gradient centralization. So gradient centralization is similar to input standardization, except that you normalize the gradients so that they have a zero mean and a unit variance. So um, yeah, and next, there are techniques for, yeah, I would say modifying the training loop, so the uh, for loop over the epochs and the mini batches. Um, so what we can do there in terms of the optimizer and things like that. I should have maybe added something like different optimizers here because there are also optimizers that go beyond adaptive learning rates. Um, we will talk about this also in more detail in later lectures. So for example, there are adaptive learning rates, which are super helpful. Um, there are also Auxiliary, auxiliary losses. So we can add additional loss functions in intermediate layers and then also modify the training intermediately. Um, we can modify the network training by having these yeah, um, additional loss functions. So one common thing that comes to mind right now would be the inception network. We will talk about that in the convolutional network section where we have multiple loss functions that we combine from different places in the network and that helps um, yeah, also training the network. So just briefly, if you have a network like that, usually you have the output here and then you have a loss function and uh, you have the label. So you have the true label. So you have your input image. The X goes into the network. Oops. 
and the y goes into the loss function together with y hat, the predicted label or probability. So you get y y hat as the loss function that you compute for backpropagation. But um, yeah, what you can also do is you can also have an intermediate value here, uh, intermediate um, prediction from the intermediate layer and also add that to the loss function. That is essentially how um, inception works and with that you can make sure that if you have a very big, big long network that also the intermediate um, layers are trained well. So Zhongzhi and I we also worked on a method related to this topic called uh, looking back, looking back to earlier layers um, for yeah designing better loss functions. Um, yeah then there's, there's also gradient clipping so avoiding like very large gradients um, so if they go too large, you, we can clip them by uh, giving a, uh, giving it a maximum value. So that is also sometimes helpful to yeah, avoid exploding gradient problems. And now the last set of techniques. Uh, I just put them also here because those are the ones that we are going to cover in this particular lecture here, in addition to these topics. So we will talk about L2 regularization and L1 regularization for yeah, um, adding a penalty for large weights. So that helps with having yeah, smaller weights and that also helps with making the network less sensitive to certain inputs. So that makes the network predictions a little bit less noisy. So reducing the variance. And we'll also talk about yeah, early stopping by looking at validation set performances and then drop out like dropping random units in the network, which is kind of like a way of adding noise to the network and then helps also with yeah, overfitting. All right, so this is just like the big picture overview of all the different techniques that spontaneously came to my mind when it comes to improving generalization performance. Again, we will talk about many of these techniques, not all of them, but many. So you just have to be patient because uh, we can only talk about one thing at a time, but I think this is probably a useful overview for you. All right, so in the next uh, video, we will talk then about overfitting by considering making our data set larger and by augmenting our existing data.